All right. So I'm actually going to delve into Tertullian before we get to the heretics, because Tertullian is a very important uh, person in the scheme of theology. Uh, Paul, you're going to make that widescreen or? In a minute. As soon as, it, as soon as my computer accepts it. There we go. Heretics and Tertullian. And I think you will see last week, you all said that it was good to see the name of the one that was challenging what they were setting as um, Christianity, Christianity and its dogma and its facts and all of those things through the various councils. So those people that challenged the status quo that came out of the Nicene Council or anything else, they were considered heretics, some rightfully so. But some, I think, you know, they didn't have to be a heretic. They just had a different point of view. Like sometimes you and I may differ on some things, but it doesn't, in my, in my assessment, it doesn't make you a non-Christian. And we're moving on to the next slide, Mr. Kaufman. Tertullian. Second and third century CE. Now you notice when I'm able to pull things that have CE common era, I do that because they no longer use before Christ and our Lord and all those things. Because even theologians have come to recognize that everyone is a, a Christian. And with that being said, you may have like I may go in and study another religion, but that uni that religion does not give me a sense that it's universal and my religion doesn't matter. So Christians have just started to do that probably in the last, I'm gonna say 50 years, not quite a hundred years. So heretics and philosophers propend the same things and are caught up in the same discussions. What is the origin of evil and why? the origin of humans and how. So Tertullian was a great thinker. As we move on to the next slide, Paul, because I want to take time with the heretics. <laughs> so I'm giving you some of his quotes, and these are things that we had to know in seminary about this gentleman. Truth persuades by teaching, but does not teach by persuading. So sometimes in my history as a believer, there were those that came to persuade you to be a Christian and to persuade you to speak in tongues and to persuade you of the baptism and things like that. But I love the way um, Tertullian puts it, uh, truth persuades by teaching. And that's exactly what our Lord and Savior did. He did a lot of teaching, but true, but it does not teach by persuading. So I think that's a profound uh, quote from Tertullian. And we're going on to the next slide. So early Christian thinkers, and that's what Tertullian was. The first major Christian author to write in Latin, Tertullian lived in Carthage. His surviving works date from 196 to 212 CE. Tertullian had strong views on church discipline, remarriage, fasting, and fleeing to avoid persecution. Because back then, if you disagreed a little bit, like if someone came in and said, I want to be Presbyterian, but I want to be immersed. Well, back then, if you disagreed and wanted, didn't want what they had, you may have to flee with your life, for your life. So, which is, we don't know those things, but it seems quite strange. And Tertullian joined the Montanists around 207 CE, a heretical sect. So you, I don't think I'm dealing with Montanus, uh, but um, he joined what was considered a heretical uh, sect. The speedy advent of Christ and the establishment of millennials are the fundamental ideas of his theology as a Montanist. He coined the phrase, the bloody martyrs, the seed of the church. So this is the father, Tertullian is the father of theology. And that is what is taught through all across this country and the world in seminaries. Tertullian is the father of theology. So he looked at the martyrs and the people that were having to flee and that they got caught and were murdered. The blood of the martyrs 
is the seed of the church. Because we know from our study in history now that the early, early church, those first believers that were non-governed, so to speak, except by the apostles, it cost them their lives because they believed the good news. And for many of us, we can say it cost me this, it cost me that. But in actuality, compared to the early church, we have not suffered. We haven't lost anything. And sometimes we have to, I know I look at myself like, woe is me, woe is me. And God is like, get over it. Nobody's cut off your arm. Mm -hmm. Nobody's tried to burn you alive. You know, and I said, God, you remember when that lady pressed my head at one time. (laughs) But Early Christian thinkers, these are people who sit down and they really verbally try to press out the details of what we now believe. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there for any questions. Yeah, I mean, I I don't understand what you mean by the speedy advent of Christ or the establishment of the millennium. The advent of Christ is the return of Christ. And you have to remember, he lived in a different time, and they still had a heightened awareness of the return. Mm-hmm. So he, he, he thought that Christ was going to be coming soon? They all did. They all did? Okay. It's not until you get to maybe uh, enlightenment and some of those different uh, eras that you see the relaxing of that. And it's about your lifestyle and living a life um, according to the dictates of our Messiah before a holy God. So you see strong views on church discipline, remarriage, because that was another thing. People had to really deal with the remarriage, just like Moses had to deal with it, uh, fasting and fleeing to avoid persecution. These are, he dealt with different issues for a church that was supposed to be waiting in great expectation of the return of the Messiah. So he thought you should not flee to avoid persecution? I think he thought that either way, I don't, I, I didn't get into the thought of that a lot, but fleeing to avoid persecution, obviously Tertullian had some issues and they came against him about some of the things because it's saying that he was part of a heretical sect, but yet he is by all theologians, philosophers, this man is studied because he is considered the father of theology, the father of the study of God. I didn't answer that correctly, Paul. <laughs> well, I mean, I was just looking at the, 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 where he says the blood of the martyrs is a seed of the church. And I was wondering if he thought that, that it was a good thing to be persecuted. Well, I don't know if any of them in any era thought it was a good thing to be persecuted. But what he's saying is kind of like what we do in the African-American community. We're standing literally in Georgia and different places on the ground where our people bled and died. It's the seed of our existence. They died so we could live. Mm -hmm. They died so Christianity could live. Better understanding, Paul, I mean, you have to, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, not the foundation of the church, the seed, because so many people got saved and changed their mind about who Yeshua is because of some people's willingness to suffer for that good news. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, because you said earlier that he had strong views on fleeing to avoid prosecution. Well, a lot of those people didn't make it. The Catholic Church executed a lot of people. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll find out as we get into Presbyterian history, if John Calvin did not did not have good running skills, he would have been one of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and even now, there are certain parts of the world you could go into and begin to preach Christianity, and it would cost you your life. Yeah, that's where the... That's where the former preacher over at Edgewood went. 
Well, may the Lord bless him and keep him. Because <laughs> the Muslim countries, they will, they will lay you out. <laughs> um, even if you're just a woman and you... Uh, as Dr. Lomax said, they got off the plane in the Muslim country and all the men kept telling the women that cover your hair and they had on their cute sandals with their nails done. They said, no, you have to cover your feet too. They were like, it's a hundred degrees. They walked out and literally armed guards came up and stopped them. They had to go in the bathroom and cover their feet. So we'll move on to the next slide. Tertullian, in your spare time, if you want to look up and read more on him, he is an important factor in uh, Christianity. We worship unity in Trinity and Trinity in union, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. Y'all got that, right? Mm -hmm. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost, but the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majestic, the majest the majesty co-eternal. This is an important, important statement. Until Tertullian, no one had said Trinity. Mm -hmm. So he is a, you know, given credit for coining that and recognizing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working in unison. While they were so busy arguing over homo usus or homo e usus, mm -hmm. he, he got it. Mm -hmm. But we worship unity in Trinity and Trinity in union. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that made Tertullian so important um, to theologians and why he became the father of theology. Because as he studied and meditated and spent all that time in prayer, he was able to glean and, and see uh, through the arguments and things like that and coin something so beautiful. I think this is such a beautiful, beautiful quote from Tertullian. And kind of sums up a, a lot of uh, what he was about. Any questions? Because I think the next slide is not Tertullian, but I'm not sure. No quick. Everyone's going to be silent. Okay, next slide. <laughs> this is the slide we saw last week that sparked so much conversation. And I wanted to expand on this because it caught your attention. And we talked at length about the Nicene Council, the eternal deity of Christ. Until the Nicene Council, it wasn't necessary for you to say Christ is a God or a deity. So Arius, Christ is um, a created being. Uh, and the good guy in this was Athanasius, uh, eternal deity of Christ confirmed. This is where they decided, this group that Constantine brought together, of all the church people that were leaders and things, he brought all those people together. And this was the agreement. Those that didn't agree walked out and were no longer a part of what we call institutionalized church. They went on on their own with their own way of being and belief. But you had to affirm that Christ was the same substance as the one who is Elion, the high God. So Constantinople, the person of Christ, Apollinaris, Christ is divine word, but not human spirit. You see the the little arguments, and then Gregory of Nastasius, uh, complete humanity of Christ confirmed, Nicene Creed confirmed. So they confirm fully God, fully human, fully God, fully human. That's where if you don't land on that, you probably are going to be in that list of bad guys. So Ephesus, uh, the person of Christ. So this is all dealing about how do they because Christ didn't write anything down about himself and no one raised these questions to the Messiah. So now you have all these believers trying to figure out these things that people are raising questions about. So complete deity of Christ affirmed. So you see that keeps getting affirmed, affirmed. Um, you teach Christ is a 
a teratirum quid, a third unique nature. I mean, it's all type of things. Flavian of Constantinople and Leo of Rome, two natures of Christ affirmed, human, divine. They never, in all of the councils that I've seen, they never strip Yeshua of his divinity from the Nicene Council till now. Most believers, when they have any meetings, that's going to be a part of your foundational thinkings about the Messiah. Any questions as we, we can go on to the next slide? Linda, any questions? No, I'm good. So Apollinarianism, Apollinarianism is a Christological, Christological heresy proposed by Apollinaris of Laodicea, who died in 390, that argues that Jesus had a human body and sensitive human soul, but a divine mind and not a human rational mind, the divine logos taking the place of the latter. So now we're, this is why this man was considered a heretic. So you tell me what's wrong with that statement, believers. Well, I think when it says that he didn't have a human rational mind, I think Jesus had a human mind. He says you were not dealing with a human mind with Yeshua. It was totally divine word mind. It was a God mind. So, I mean, so you see, you can see here. Um, I would have loved to have been there for the arguments to see what they had to say. Um, and there may be people that still believe this. So that gets into why he was a heretic. He had a human body, sensitive human soul, but a divine mind. He had too much time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to think, those that were the high thinkers and the, the bishops and the priests and things like that, that was their life study, just like the scribes and the Pharisees and the rabbis of our Jewish brothers and sisters. There's a large amount of time spent thinking, reading, re-exegeting, examining the language, everything like that. And we'll move on to the next heretic. Nestorius. He was an archbishop of Constantinople uh, from April, oh, they misspelled April, 428 to June 22, 431. He is considered the originator of the Christological heresy known as Nestorianism, which emerged when he began preaching against the title Theotokos. In Greek, the, you can see it there, Theotokos, or Mother of God, beginning to be used of the Virgin Mary he distinguished between Logos, divine nature, and Christ, the Son, the Lord, as a union of divine nature and human nature. He refused to attribute the human acts and the sufferings of Jesus to the divine nature, arguing that God could not suffer on the cross as God is omnipotent. That is a good argument. Come on, guys. That's a good argument. No, y'all not putting any skin in the game tonight, are you? <laughs> Except for Paul. I mean, that's to, partly it's just humans that don't totally understand. That that's a that's an easy route to go to. They don't totally understand. But if it is your job, this is why he becomes a heretic. If your job as a priest is to be a part of the teaching and the preaching to the people, then then this mm -hmm. becomes a problem. Because mm -hmm. they don't want Mary was a human being, and they're calling her the mother of God. Now, in every African spiritual religion that I know of. Mm -mm, they don't go for that because they understand the broadness. And I'm just going to 
argue from their point of view, the broadness of who the most high God is could not reside in a woman. She, it would kill her. So this is some of what they're trying to break it up to make it make sense for themselves when they can't fully buy into Mm -hmm. Jesus being God. And that's what I see this as. The heretics are still trying to work out, wait a minute, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. God Almighty is so powerful. You know, you would explode. Would you be able to take that that type of power? What's what's your vampire movie? Which one? Twilight? Yeah. It's kind of like the Twilight Saga. In... In that, in her. where she had to become a vampire to handle the power of the vampire inside of her, but yet she had a child and that was that, a very special that, child, a that, unique mm-hmm. child. But the only mm-hmm. the only way she could do that was to become a vampire. The only way she, Miss Virginia, is calling me. Hold on, Miss Virginia. Okay, I'll let him know. All right, bye. Paul, Miss Virginia done called and said, unmute people. They can't make a comment. <laughs> I can't I can't unmute people. They have to unmute themselves. She's saying that you've got them mute. Like I see Linda's not muted. Miss Carolyn wasn't when we started. Uh, but she's saying she's trying to make a comment and she let me, let me check then. I can unmute myself. Right. Hi, Harriet. <laughs> mm-hmm. I usually cannot unmute them. They have to do it themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't see. Well, wait a minute. Here we go. Where's Miss Virginia? There she right is. Uh-huh. I can't. I mean, it's not going to let me. Unmute. She she needs to unmute it. Yeah, she needs to do it herself. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um. Oh, someone want to give her a call? Okay. And um, so I think everybody. Well, uh, Jetty, Miss Lights is not unmu- is not unmuted, but everybody else is. I think. Right. Right. Well, except Harriet, but she knows how to undo it. Right. Right. She does. Yeah, I I can't. I can't unmute. All I can do is ask them to unmute. Okay, so I will. So let me ask you this: Looking at some of the standards as we go on, through people that are that are raising questions of, and being called heretics, um, can okay. you think okay. of any? Um, can you think of any denominations now that under these guidelines would be heretical? I can. I'm sorry. Can you think of any denominations? That, that don't fully live in that thinking that came out of the Nicene Council. So now when I say Nicene Council, you all get what I'm talking about. It was a standard that was raised at that council that has never been lowered. I I don't know know too much about the Seventh-day Adventists or some of those more sect-like organizations, but... Seven Day Adventist would, I think, would be in line with this. Okay. With what the standard is from the Nicene Council that said that Yeshua is the same substance as God, not just the Son of God, but the same substance as God. Mormons, while Mormons are Christians, they may not fall into that line. Hmm. Uh, I don't think, um, I'm not sure if Jehovah Witnesses would fall into this line either. So it begins, it should give you different thoughts as you begin to look or listen to other denominational, their foundational truths and beliefs. We flesh ours out in the book of confession and, you know, and that changes over a period of time. The confessions grow and change. If you go read the older confessions, I'm sorry, but we all, we're not going to make it, y'all. Because they were very strict and, and, you know, 
on certain things. But as we went on at times changing, humans be, gained more knowledge about certain things. New confessionals came forward that were a little different. But the foundation has remained the same with the Presbyterians, I can say that, in my, in my assessment. So any question about Nestorius? We'll go to the next heretic. I, Miss Virginia, if you're able to speak now, raise whatever question you want to raise. This morning on her podcast, former viewer Michelle Collins speculated. Uh oh. Lynch. Part of me wondered if she sort of sacrificed her. I don't knowledge. hear her. Miss Carolyn, did you have a question? No. Okay. So we'll, I don't want to go too far ahead. This sounded like Miss Virginia had something she wanted to say when she called me. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell her to call back and answer the question, and then you can say it out where we could hear. Yeah, I'll call her. CNN President Jeff Zucker has just resigned after disclosing a consensual relationship with a college. Charlotte's uh, Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer. Oh, where'd she go? There she is. Who just resigned? I heard someone's news. <laughs> oh, the CNN uh, president. Oh, okay. A CEO of CNN. Miss Virginia? Well, I, I was able to get out of uh, unmute, but then since as, uh, as, I don't know, it's something going to happen, and then the next thing I know, I've got on mute. But every time I get to unmute, the host would not let you in. So I just said, okay. Okay, now, um, so you need to get back into the room? I'm, I'm already in. Uh, I need to get, I cannot get. Okay, so what? I just tell me to log back in. Okay, Miss Virginia, go ahead and raise your question. Everybody, I'm going to put my phone up to my speaker so they can hear okay. you. What questions did you have? My question was, at the time that the, the, uh, the apostles, after Christ had died and the apostles were going around teaching, the persons that are doing the changing of the laws of the, of the uh, acceptance of, of, to be a Christian, were they a part of the, was a part of the apostles? Or they just pick that up on their own. That's what I'm trying to say. Was well, that a part of the apostles' teaching after Christ was uh, crucified? Uh, this is something they just picked up on their own through the Romans. Well, actually, uh, I think it's Apollinarius, Apollyon. He was a student of um, the disciple John. Okay. But I will say that these were questions that were not from anything I've read, were not raised when the apostles were uh, still living at all. All of these questions come about when you get the circling of um, Constantine bringing everybody together and saying, everybody, we got to all get on the same page because you had believers who were free. They didn't have to give in to a certain type of dogma. They just know that they accepted that Christ was the Messiah, the son of God, and they went on. They didn't ask, well, was as the son of God, was he the same substance or similar substance? Those things came up when you got really heavy thinkers and they just wanted everyone on the same page. And you had like the super apostles and people beginning to teach different things. And if you remember, the apostle Paul had to deal with the super uh, apostles who were out teaching and doing things, and they were skewing just a little bit of the teachings of the apostles, and Paul rebuked them. Okay. 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 okay I'm going to Okay. So I don't know if anyone else in your reading, I'm not the only student of the Bible, so if you guys have any comments, please do, but that's my assessment. You see Paul dealing with that. You see Paul dealing with um, the Judaizers. Of all the apostles, Paul is the one who wrote and verbally dealt with 
uh, Judaizers, super apostles. Those writings don't come into play from uh, the other uh, writings of the apostles and those that follow, like Luke and, and, and those. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. But you know, Shonda, why, why did he preach against uh, the title uh, Theotokos? I mean, if Christ and God were the same substance, then and and uh, how could he not know that Mary was the mother of God? He he knew what was or, taught. was he separating God and Jesus, his son. Once they deified Jesus, and Jesus is, is a deity now, Mary stops being called the Virgin Mary. And she's being called the mother of God. That's what he had a problem with. Before it was the Virgin Mary. It wasn't the mother of God. It was the Virgin Mary. Even that too has shifted because now Jesus is a deity. Post, I mean, pre um, Nicene Council. If people had questions about that, it wasn't out there. Not until you got the... uh, Emperor of Rome now saying he's a Christian and by law, everyone in Rome had to be a Christian. They were a Christian country and he called this council and they said, okay, we're going to get our bullet points together. We're all going to be on the same page. And those that don't want to be on that page are not a part of this, what was being created as the Roman Catholic church. Okay. Okay. So, Paul, we'll go on to the next slide. I hope this is helping because it really is a wrangling uh, over um, theological thought and way of being down to, I mean, the minutia of things. So, you you teaches one of these heresies, well, you teachianism, name you teaches a fifth century monk. (laughs) You teach he's taught that Christ possesses only one nature, that the divine nature of Christ swallows up or absorbs the human nature of Jesus, such that he is left without one theanthropic nature from the Greek theos, God, and anthropos, man. So human divine mixture. Can you see why this would have been heretical? Not really. Well, he's saying the Nicene Council, being the standard now, says that he is the same substance as God. He didn't need to have all this mixed. He was divine. But he was also human. But he would, according to the Nicene Council, he was divinity. He was the same substance as God. So he was like, as we say, Emmanuel, God with us, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's tricky. But this is our history. Paul raises good questions um, because you look at this. Is I think it's more the how-to, the following of his thinking that um, the divine nature of Christ, that divine part, swallows and absorbs the human part. And see, I don't know about you, but I just happen to believe that Christ came to show us how to live our best human life in this, in, in this life and do the same things that he did. Because we have the we have the same spirit living and dwelling and moving in us that was living and dwelling and moving in Christ. Now the difference is Christ had the Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, without measure. It, the Holy Spirit is measured to us. Some people have more Holy Spirit, or should I say, anointing than others. Any further questions? Well, we will move on to the next slide. So um, you guys, I couldn't imagine living at that time because you the thing, these are the people that could afford to read and go to school. And if you're just a regular believer, you're like, really? 
So St. Thomas Aquinas defines heresy as a species of unbelief belonging to those who profess the Christian faith but corrupt its dogmas. So the corrupting of the standard is what made you really, in my assessment, heretical. Because if you didn't just say this, it's kind of like the same thing when you meet people who are um, Pentecostal, and I can be Pentecostal myself. And they will go on and on as if it's the gospel, the evidence of the spirit is speaking in tongues. You don't speak in tongues. You got to have the evidence of spirit of, by speaking in tongues. Let me lay hands on you so you can receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. It is just nonstop. But I'm not going to say it's heretical. It's just sometimes I have to look at people like, look, now go on, leave me alone now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Orthodox Catholicism derives from the deposit of faith, the sum of all truths revealed in sacred scripture and sacred tradition and entrusted to the care of the church. Heresy derives from the same deposit of faith, but denies or alters some part of it. So Paul, Linda, Miss Carolyn, Mr. and Mrs. Lights, Harriet, some of our thought may deny or alter parts of what they deemed as standard. Yes, yes. Okay. So deposit of faith, but denies or alters some part of it. A person may enter into heresy in one of two ways. Material heresy entered into through ignorance of the truth or misunderstanding or incomprehension of some aspects of faith. This species is merely a mistake that needs correcting. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what Paul did. Okay, you guys have come from all these different temples worshiping people. Now look at here, you can't be marrying your daddy's wife. Let's just get that straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what you used to do. But now you got to raise your standard of living. That is not a godly life because you're uncovering your father's nakedness when you do that. So formal heresy, freely choosing with full understanding of the teachings of the church to hold doctrines that are contradictory to those of the church. Okay. Any this, you know, he makes this very, very plain, very plain. So you can see why these men in all of their, their believing and wanting to do their best. And it's just like presenting a paper in seminary. And some people, you know, we'd be like, well, what on earth are they talking about? But they would explain it out and work it out. And, you know, you may have to debate it, but it still didn't, wasn't in line with what the church deems as foundational things if that makes any sense. Any questions to be raised at this point? That might be the last slide, is it, Paul? No? No idea. Hit uh, me, Paul. <laughs> but Go ahead. It just, having dogmas that, that aren't that aren't continuing to grow can lead to things like the Spanish Inquisition and a lot of the issues we have today, the, church, the churches have today about uh, abortion. I agree. <coughs> you know, the thing <coughs> is, is someone um, it's as if in, there was no movement. They were not going to move from that. Whatever was said and, you know, the notes and things like that were not kept from the, Ni the Nicene Council. So it was almost like an oath that, you know, in pre 
perpetuity. We're going to keep this. Christ is divine. This, this, anything that skews that even a, a minuscule amount, her heretical. There was no room for any other type of thinking. The problem I think we have today is there's room for every kind of thinking. Yeah. Every kind, but you can see why you um you get the breaks and the schisms that start to happen when the Protestants start breaking away from the Catholic Church. But it wasn't about these things we're discussing. In in this early church, I know in the in for a long period of the Catholic Church. Nobody was allowed to actually read the Bible except the priests. Or they read it in a language they didn't even speak. Yeah. Well, you would have been executed if you were uh, found to be in possession of a Bible in your language. They would kill you. You weren't allowed to have any kind of Bible, were you? No, no. If you were not sanctioned by the church as a priest or um, a scribe or something like that and given permission to handle sacred text, you died, period. So the thing is, if you remember at the Nicene Council, people had access to all of these documents. Before then, people were passing the letters of Paul and the letters of Peter and the, the gospels that were written out by Mark and Matthew and Luke, they would spread those around. I might come and say, Patty said, oh, did you bring me a copy of, of the gospel of John? I sure did. Here it is. There's, there's none of that. It's as if they seized and took control of the writings as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have so many um, people rushing and especially theologians to study like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, because believers who knew and felt like they're taking our writings so that they can control everything, they hid those things. The Nag Hammadi Library was literally buried in a field and a farmer was farming and found this little bound book and it finally got translated. And it has the Gospel of Mary in it, the Gospel of, um, I think it has the Gospel of Thomas and, and things like that. Those were Gospels that were not accepted by the Nicene Council. So you don't get into that. And you get this big argument on homo usus or homo e usus. But the documents to me are some of the, the bigger uh, discussions I would have loved to have known more about. Because it's clear they circled the wagons on documents. But they did that, if you remember, through our study, they, um, def for me, they defined what was God-inspired. And, and that, that was the thing. Some things they deemed as not being God-inspired. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of those things that has all those extra writings or the Gnostic documents and things like that, they're deemed uh, as being non-God inspired. And you know, I tell you all the time, when Mary Magdalene raises a question to Jesus, when I have a vision, what do I see it with? My soul or my spirit? Jesus says to her, neither one. You see it with the mind that sits between the two. I'm sorry, but that was divinely inspired for me. Because <laughs> if your mind is not right and it's all messed up, then how are you going to understand a vision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got three more slides. All right, Paul, hit it. You take my time too. All right, we're doing good on time. Heretics. So the Arians opposed the Nicene uh, Council at 325. Um, Apollinarius condemned uh, at first uh, Constantinople in 381. Christ had a human body and a human sensitive soul, but no human rational mind. He had a, a godly mind. Uh, Nestorians condemned by... So I put this here for you to see the reason they had some of these councils was to, because so many people were listening to the Arians, Apollinarians, and the Nestorians. They had to stop it. 
They had to say, no, this is heretical. Absolutely not. Okay. Okay. So, what Nestorian was saying that Mary should not be called the mother, mother of God. God. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. The That's Virgin Mary they got, but not the mother of God. So that would chip away at Jesus being the same substance, wouldn't it? Well, why? How can she be the mother of only the human side when it was one body? <laughs> Patty, good question. Mm -hmm. that makes <laughs> when you think about that, you can raise all type of questions. But in, in some spiritual circles and things like that, for a woman to physically carry God Almighty, you have to deal with the fact that Jesus is the son of God. And that's how some people, especially certain Protestants, they build everything into Jesus and forget mm -hmm. about the father. It's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Someone sent Jesus according to the text now. You can go back and study all of Isaiah. He was being sent to be the Messiah. A body being prepared for him. So it's a lot there to unpack. Story is what makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense to you, Paul? Well, it does. Is, actually, what the story says still makes sense to me. And that's, for me, that's fine. For them, they would have been off with your head. <laughs> you would have been out of here. It's, it's, um, it's what they want the masses to believe. See, Paul, you're a thinker by nature, by study. You're a thinker. People that sit down and think, um, you get to the point where you can look at something. Well, what difference does it make? Yeah. Moving on to the next slide. That means we've got two more to go, right, Paul? I want to make sure I don't keep everyone too long That's tonight. Two more. Now All right. Two more. All right, so this, I'm going to give you the list here. The Judaizers, remember I said Paul had to deal with them. Taught dietary restrictions and circumcision were necessary to be saved. Refuted at the Council of Jerusalem in 50 AD. So that came before the Nicene. It sure did. Oh, my goodness. So they was, remember, Peter was saying, I can't eat with the uncircumcised. They're unclean. Mm -hmm. They're people that have eaten pork. That's what this was dealing with because that still made you um, like some of, I think it was Apollinarius or one of them I was reading. He came from pagan parents and then heard the good news and was a believer and then became a heretic. So Gnosticism, we all know about Gnosticism, right? Because I taught at length about Gnosticism. Emphasize knowledge, which I believe some Christians can still invite some knowledge in. I'm just saying. You won't have spit all over your, over your face if you invite a little knowledge in. Over ecclesiastical authority and believe the material world create, created by an evil demurge. So that, we all know Marcion was a heretic and said that the Old Testament God was irrelevant and evil, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there you go, Marcion, second century. Sabellianism, Sabellian taught the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with three different modes of God. Heretic. Novationism. So, so, I mean, if we were to hit on all of them, they probably would say Charlottism, <laughs> Paulism. <laughs> Novation, novation refused readmission of lapsy Christians who had denied their faith under persecution by Emperor Decius. So, I guess once you were put out, you were put out. So, if you had denied your faith, that made you a heretic. So if you deny that Yeshua is same substance, that made you a heretic and put you out of church. They ain't let you back in. It wasn't like you went up the road and decided to be Baptist for five years and came back to Presbyterian Church. We said, hey, welcome back. Bless the Lord. They said, no, you can't come here. How about that? Paul? Paul? Who's going to raise a question? Any comments? There's a, who was the, who was the,
the big theologian you started with. Tertullian. Tertullian. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, that may have been kind of what he was saying about, about fleeing persecution. Right. Because if you're fleeing, you're put out of the church. John Calvin was put out of the church. Mm -hmm. And if you go and you repent and you say, I believe all the same things you believe, they still may kill you just to make you an example because you, you uh, made people think they could go against what was the standard, the, the Catholic church, so to speak. That was the standard, what they said you believe. And all they were doing after uh, Luther uh, went against the church was just saying, you know, some of these things you're doing have nothing to do with Jesus being a deity or not. It has to do with how much money you get. Because people had to pay, you know, if they send or something, they said, well, pay 500,000 and God, God, God forgive you. you your sins are absolved. That's a lot of it, That's a lot of what? a lot of what was happening in the, in the church in like the, the dark ages. Right. And, and some ages. people may have had means and money, but because they did exactly, they thought they were being godly by doing exactly what the priest said, they ended up losing their wealth and all those things and their property or their children would say, okay, our dad was a bad man, blah, blah, blah. Well, to keep your dad from going to hell and being in purgatory, sign over all his property. These days, young people would be like, daddy going to hell. <laughs> Daddy's going to be in purgatory for a minute. Because we don't have the concept of we can pay, pay our ways, way out of spiritual um, wrongdoings. You have to repent your way out of spiritual wrongdoing. That's the way most of us believe, right or wrong. Glad I can't you say, most. huh? I'm glad you said most. Oh Lord! <laughs> All right, Linda. Now, but you you get what I'm saying. We put an emphasis emphasis on if you're wrong, admit it, repent, don't do it again. But now, if you keep doing it, then we might be dealing with some spiritual issues, or you know, it could be a whole plethora of things. And that's usually where the priest or you know, come in, in my assessment. When people have issues that they just can't get by and you get godly counsel over a long period of time. Move on to the next slide, Paul. Pelagonism. Pelagus taught that the original sin did not taint human nature and were capable of choosing good without the aid of grace. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's someone that they preach something similar to that. It's not exactly, but they say that since Christ rose and ascended to heaven, you know, he was the second Adam. If the first Adam caused all of us to be born into sin, now those after Jesus aren't born into sin. That's their argument. Any questions on that? I mean, that is actively being taught now, and a lot of people support it. Um, is that part of the Unitarian belief? Um. No, it's a specific preacher. I don't want to mention his name, but he was very popular. If I say enough, you guys will figure out who I'm talking about. He ended up being openly rebuked by Oral Roberts for some of these beliefs. Does he, you know, they said, that's not what we taught you here, but it's universal belief. So Unitarians may, I don't, I've never read what they believe, Paul, but I'm assuming it's along that line that everybody just isn't a sinner. The stereotype is that they don't believe anything. But. Oh, they believe something. They <laughs> believe something. So, um, so we know about Arianism, that Jesus was uh, subordinate to the Father, not the same substance. Nestorianism uh, taught, uh, 
why they give me all these hard words? Christ had two natures. I know, Chris, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Loosely <laughs> jointed, rejected concept of hypostatic union. Mm -hmm. um, so reaction, so monophysitism reacted true. to I'm Nestorianism, taught, the taught that Christ had nature. only a single divine nature. So you see, some of it is in response to others. Um, Taught that Jesus has two natures, but only one uh, divine will. So that when you get into the whole part of that, that Jesus had, you know, know. two natures, but only one divine will. A iconoclasm, social belief in the importance of the destruction of icons and other images. So early church, early Catholicism, no images. Mm-hmm. And they had a meeting to restore that people could have certain images and thing and things like that. Even though the Catholic uh, Church, the priest, this is, I don't want you to the priest, those that were given, you know, ordained and stuff, they were getting million dollar pictures and stuff. That's why the Catholic Church has uh, such a wide, um, you know, they have artwork that's just priceless. Because they were taking the artwork. Oh, and I, oh, when I first read that, well, didn't they think to say, if we're not supposed to have images, that, doesn't that include you? Take that. Forth. Just saying. So one more slide, Paul, or is that it? I think this is it. Okay. So the floor is open. We won't stay on long, but I hope that this part of church history has added a blessing to your life. If you have any questions. <sighs> I've enjoyed this reminded me of seminary <laughs> and how hard it was. Well, you know, it, it, it sort of explains why, why so, so many religions tend to splinter off. Splinter off? What do you mean by splinter off? Let me, you know, let me get you. Like, like the um, Amish broke away from the Mennonite church. Um, you know, kind of like uh, Grace Church broke away from First Pres. I mean, you know, it's it's and it's, it's all because of theological beliefs. Some of it's not theological. Some of it is um, how you believe human humans should dwell together. Churches have split over that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because let's face it. The first church split for first prayers wasn't that. It was when they decided to put the, the Africans out because they didn't want to look at black people worshiping. That was the first their first church split, whether they, they know it or not. Hmm. Hmm. They came and joined first prayers and were happy to be there, those four little people. And even when they took them and they put them behind the organ, they didn't leave. So the first church split to me was that. Mm -hmm. And it's just human nature. If you don't believe exactly like me, if you voted for this and I, the same thing, now you've got um, a Republican saying, if you're a liberal, you can't be a Christian. If you are a Democrat, you are not a Christian. I was like, well, since when did that have anything to do with my Christianity? <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, well, mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Your confession. See, my thing is, and maybe one day I'll do it. I think we've had so many different good news moments that people miss the main news. And the main news is we had a man that came and died for us, mm -hmm. went to hell for us. Mm -hmm. And somebody was like, well, you know, you got to do, that's another gospel. I, I just stick to the one I got and I'm good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you start adding, you know, my pet peeve, don't tell me I need to add something to myself. Jesus mm -hmm. wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. What else I got to add? So when you look at all of these things, your church history it, like Patty just started, she gave a good example. There are still disagreements of uh, denominations breaking up. 
I know a gentleman that went to seminary at his church that he took over for his dad. The women still sit in the back. If they're having their monthly, they can't even come anywhere near certain people. Mm. And they would beat them if they tried to come up front. I, I thought that was the craziest thing. This is right now somewhere in Metro Atlanta. It is a church. Mm. Hmm. And you know what? Somebody said, we should go. When we have such and such, I'm like, well, I ain't got them. <laughs> you know, it's like, nah, I, I had enough whoopings when I was a little girl. And it sounded like these men would whoop your behind for going up there. And my dad taught me, when you walk in someone's church, you respect their house. Their house. Because mm -hmm. if, if I walk into a church of God in Christ, everybody's speaking in tongues and praying. I would just join in speaking in tongues and go on about my business. I would say, wait a minute now. Paul said everything had to be interpreted. They'd be like, get out of here. There's been a thousand people speaking in tongues. Who has <laughs> to interpret all that. <laughs> so um, it's it's so many little, like little things uh, that splinter and split us, but you can see that's kind of been historical. Because all those, those early councils, people broke away from it. But you still have some Christians who follow um, rabbinical ways as far as eating, of the seven day Adventists going to church on a uh, Saturday thing. And they're absolutely right. That is the Sabbath, but the Sabbath Sunday became the Sabbath for Christians because they wanted to live and not die. Cause to go to the Jewish church meant you were going to die. And that's become our historical way. We worship on Sunday. So I hope Guys, I've done a lot of work bringing this to you, and I hope I've been able to adequately answer your questions. And next week, we start Presbyterian history, and uh, Miss Patty Kaufman is going to lead us off with Presbyterian history. I will be here. So, Patty, I'm going to have some good questions. Okay, good. <laughs> I won't know the answers that we can always discuss. You will know mm -hmm. the answers. Okay. You know the answers. So uh, one of the things I would love for you to look at as well uh, with John Calvin, did any of the heretical notions have any effect and can you see any of them in his teachings? That's a Dr. Welter question. Hey, <laughs> taking Patty to seminary. So, and that'll, that'll finish up. We'll go through, it'll take us the remainder of the month of February. It's a short month, but it will take us uh, that much time to get through. And I will just bone up on my Presbyterian history, so to speak. Uh, you guys do as well, so that uh, we come fresh and able to raise, you know, adequate questions and things like that to what uh, Patty presents. So if there are no further questions, I think Miss Virginia hung up on me because I kept talking. <laughs> it's Wednesday night. Her shows are on. Oh, okay. Okay. Gracious God, thank you from the beginning to the end. Show us if anything in history that we need to revisit as a group and discuss. Bring it to the table. God, I ask that you would uh, bless Patty as she goes forward, putting together to present our own church history, the Presbyterian history. And God, I pray that this has indeed added a blessing to each and every one of those that are here and have been here over the last five weeks. This has added a blessing. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Oh, Charlotte.